I would love to hear what your advice would be or actually what kind of features you would include in a course for 17 to 18 year olds if there was a course on building personal wealth, build, building towards financial independence in life? What would be some of the critical features of that course? It's really, um, it's a really hard subject that I care a lot about um, because it's, it's, in some ways it's super simple, in some ways it's really complex. Hey everyone, Johnny here, welcome to this video. Today I'm going to be sharing a special video, a special conversation that I had on my other personal YouTube channel, which is Johnny Boyle, J-O-N-N-Y-B-O-Y-L-E, would really appreciate if you guys subscribe to that as well. But it's a conversation that I had with Alex Hormozy, who is worth somewhere between 65 and $80 million. He also runs a bunch of companies and he's an entrepreneur himself. And those companies make around $100 million in sales every year. So this is a guy who really knows his way around business, entrepreneurship and wealth building. You're probably thinking, why is Johnny sharing this conversation? You know, this is about the HSC. This is about education. This is about learning literature. And that's all true. But remember, I'm doing this channel because my passion is education. And I feel like educating young people about wealth and business and money is something that's really important. Now, in my opinion, money should not be your number one goal in life. It should not dictate what you do with your life. For me, I've pursued the path of education, even though I probably would have made a lot more money early on if I had just gone down the conventional path of being a lawyer or doing something with my economics degree as well. Uh, but instead, I've chosen to do education because this is what I'm passionate about and I'm trying to build a meaningful business around it. Okay, so money is not everything to me, but I think being educated about money is so important. Knowing what to do with your savings, how to invest, how to actually build wealth so that you don't have financial problems for your whole life. A lot of people don't actually think about money. They don't think about how important wealth is because it can be a bit of a taboo kind of subject. People are like, oh, we don't want to talk about money, not when we're 17 or 18. But actually thinking back, if I had had a little bit more information, if I had been educated about it a little bit more, I probably would have been looking to save even more money than I did and invest more money early on because of the compounding returns that you get in life. Now, I want to share this conversation with you because it's really important for that reason. And I think Alex Hormozy, someone who is worth like $100 million, is someone we should all listen to. Listen to people who have made a lot of money when it comes to money. Okay, now don't get the message wrong. Money is not everything. Money shouldn't be your number one driver. It's certainly not mine. My philosophy is all about passion and doing what's meaningful to you. But you want to be able to do what's meaningful to you in a way that can still make you financially stable and by extension make you financially free. You don't want to have money problems your whole life and you need to get this stuff sorted while you're young. So no matter what path you go down, it literally doesn't matter. As long as you do what you're passionate about, that's the main thing. But in the background, you should always be thinking about what should I do with the money I make from my passion? What should I do with my savings? How much should I save? How important is this? And you might also be wondering whether you should run your own business. What are the risks involved there? Or should you just be an employee and make income from a salary? So we discuss all of these things in this conversation. Again, I would really appreciate if you guys subscribed to my personal YouTube channel at Johnny Boyle, J-O-N-N-Y, B-O-Y-L-E. It's in the link here and I'll put it in the description below. Would really appreciate that. And if you want to watch the full conversation, please go there as well. But otherwise, I hope you enjoy and I hope you learn something about business and wealth in this video. Just to rewind more to the beginning of your journey, even though right now you're a really successful entrepreneur, you invest in a bunch of companies, you have the gym launch. Before you entered that space, you're actually a management consultant, right? Mm -hmm. What made you choose that career to begin with? And why did you leave when you did? So I, uh, there was only two businesses or two career paths that seemed appealing to me out of college. One was investment banking and the other one was uh, management consulting. And I saw um, being a management consultant as the, the more interesting of the two, uh, you know, in terms of monetary career paths, those were the two most lucrative that I knew of because the idea of entrepreneur entrepreneurship literally was not really a thought of mine. So th this is just, cause I know you have a younger audience. Um, like I, I feel a lot of the, the online stuff that we see, the TikTok, the Instagram stuff that's out there is like very, you know, 
entrepreneurs are always entrepreneurs. They're born entrepreneurs. Like you're, you know, if you're not slinging lemonade stands, then you're not a legit entrepreneur. I had jobs through high school and you know, had a job in college and, and, you know, and I got job after college. Like I didn't really have any of that. Um, I was a good student. I didn't fail at school. <laughs> like I worked hard and I got good grades. Um, but it was actually just when I, uh, once I started the management consulting career, um, the idea I thought was that I was going to expose a lot of industries and businesses and I would learn a lot about business and maybe eventually start my own business, just like everyone says. And I'd like to someday own my own business, right? That's just like kind of a thing that you say. And, uh, but it, I didn't realize it was going to happen as quickly as it did for me. Um, and honestly, if I didn't have that job that I had at college, I don't think I, I don't know if I'd be an entrepreneur, honestly. Um, mm. I, I honestly just really, really, it had nothing to do with the company or the people or anything like that. I just like, I just didn't like the work. I just was very miserable. And so I remember being so incredibly depressed that I was just like, I was contemplating whether I wanted to keep living. And so wow. it was, it was, it was for me, the biggest fear was the judgment of my peers and most specifically my family, right? If I, if I were to quit this thing, because at that time I was the prodigal son, you know, I, mean, I did everything right. And so to leave that um, for, you know, being a gym owner was not considered fairly, you know, very prestigious mm. um, from, from the path that I was on. And, um, and, and I'll say this to this, to everybody who's listening, that decision was the single hardest and scariest decision I have ever made in my entire life. There is nothing that entrepreneurship has ever shown me that has even come close to the difficulty of that decision. And so if, if right now you feel like that's really hard for you as somebody who's achieved what most people would consider material success, it, like, it is the hardest decision. So if it feels ridiculously hard, that's normal. And it feels that hard for everyone. Um, and for me, the only reason I was able to make the call, because I'm actually a fairly risk averse person. The only reason I was able to make that call um, was because I was faced with just dying. And so I was like, well, mm. if I don't want to be alive doing what I'm doing, then I might as well try something that I like doing, even if I don't make any money. And so that was what kind of started me in the gym path. But then obviously whatever, whatever business talent, desire, interest kicked on as soon as I got into the business world, I was like, oh, I actually like, so what ended up happening for me was that I've been obsessed with fitness for a decade. I had several state records. I was already in very good shape. People would ask me for advice. So I kind of had that already. Mm. But when I got into the business game, I actually felt not out of love with, with fitness, but I fell so in love with business that it, it my fitness desires paled in comparison. And I was pretty into fitness, um, <laughs> but it, it didn't even come close. And so it was like that business became my first love. And, um, and we've been in love ever since. <laughs> Yeah, I always find that interesting about the risk point because the way I look at things is it's if if happiness is the metric or at least happiness in that long-term satisfaction sure. sense, not being miserable, then it makes complete sense and it's not even risky to try and do something that you're passionate about is is the way I think about it. So it's almost riskier staying in that job as you kind of alluded to in, in a really extreme way. Um, so I love that. And, and in terms of like risk and uncertainty, I feel like, that risk of going out and working on something that you love can often offset uh, people's willingness to leave a job that they're actually not happy with. And I, I think we see that all over society and, and that's a really common theme today and probably has been forever. You know, people doing things that they don't love because they're afraid of what will happen if they make that shift. Uh, but I've also heard you say, which is really interesting, that if you were to have your time over, from a financial perspective, at least, and, and please do clarify on this, you would almost choose to keep a high salary paying job, stay an employee and not go into the entrepreneurship space. Uh, I'd love you for you to talk to that. And where do you currently stand in that balance between I, passion, risk and, and happiness and freedom? It's really hard. You know what I mean? It's very hard for me because I think having achieved, you know, what we've achieved in terms of material numbers, I don't know if the audience knows, but. Um, You're doing like $85 million a year, right? Revenue. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, just right. Just for, for context for the audience. So it's not like we just sold a seven figure course and like we're posting about Lambos and stuff. It, you know, we've, <laughs> we've achieved a material amount and it continues to, to pump out cash flow every day. And um, I just know how little it affected my, my life, but I will say that money created space for me to have better, better thoughts. And so I would say I'm definitely, um, 
I'm definitely more content about life now than I ever have been. Um, but it's taken me a long time to get here. I don't think I was a, I don't think I was naturally a happy person. Um, I was naturally very hardworking. I was naturally, naturally inclined to sacrifice, um, which I think led well to entrepreneurship because I was just willing to trade anything because I wasn't. So in some ways I wasn't that content doing anything. And so I was like, I might as well just work all the time. And in, in some ways the work distracted me from the, the discontent that I was suffering from in my life. And so I was, I was very, I was very content being fully stimulated all the time by work. And there's not many things that stimulate you like entrepreneurship does. And I still believe that to this day, just because the game changes. Um, but I think the, the point of the, the specific statement that you were, that you were referencing is that I think for most, there's many, many more people that I think would be well served just continuing in a high paying career path, um, if the, if the goal is financial freedom, there, there's a lot of broke business owners. And that's the thing that like Instagram doesn't show. Like the median income for a business owner is $50,000 a year. Like it's like, if it's like, I'm going to, some, I, I even said, I was like, someday I'd like to own my own business. If I said someday I'd like to make $50,000 a year, I think people would probably take that differently, right? Mind you, that's the median. means half the people are below that. So like context, right? It matters. And unless you're willing to like, you have to have some sort of like sadistic side of your masochistic side of yourself that like, is just willing to endure years, not months of, of suffering and punishment, because it is not an easy game. It is a very thankless game. Um, and <laughs> I, and, and maybe I would have experienced this either way. And maybe I'm just, I'm just voicing the discontent of life. Right. <laughs> but I would say that now we've, you know, we've, we've achieved enough now that um, I, I very much enjoy the game. And it's just like, I just recognize how statistically rare the outcome that I have accomplished is. And so as much as, as much as there is this desire in the influencer space to be like, you know, do what I did, you can do it, be like me, whatever the, you know, whatever that mantra is, I'm not saying that me personally, I think that there's a lot more credit to, I mean, there, there's, there's credit is due in investment bankers who make $3 million a year and have a job there. There's management consultants who make a million dollars a year. There's, and that's income, not revenue. Right. And mm. that's a big other point is that people hear that a dry cleaning business does $600,000 a year, but they don't look at the owner income, you know, which is 60 grand or whatever it mm. is, you know, it's, it's not nearly as high. And then you also have, and this is the piece that I think most people miss is that the stress associated with that is high. And so I'll tell you a quick story that I think might illustrate this or make this real. So if you were to go to Thanksgiving dinner, right, and say, hey, grandma, you know, and this is kind of like I have this paper sketch that it's the fallacy of never enough. But in our minds, we think if I just made an extra insert number, I'll be secure. I'll feel good. I'll be wealthy. Insert whatever good feeling you have. Right. And I think some people know that that's probably not true, but I'll just show it with numbers. So. If I make a million dollars a year in take-home income on a $10 million business, okay, top line. So 10% net margin, that's fairly common. You know what I mean? For a business, we run better margins than that because we've taken a lot of time to do that. But a lot of businesses run 10, 15% margins and that's very normal, right? And, you know, you could go to, to, to dinner at your family's house and you could say, hey, I make a million dollars a year. They're like, why are you stressing about money? You're making a million dollars a year. But to the entrepreneur, they realize that they have, they have, they have like a month and a half of cash flow hmm. because your fixed costs are $833,000 a month. <laughs> right. Hmm. Or sorry, hmm. I know you're fixed. Uh, if you're, if you're making a million, then it would be uh, whatever, $750,000 a month in fixed costs. Yeah. So it's like, I got to make eight, I got to make $750,000 before I start making my first dollar. Hmm. That's that could be heavy. And I remember when I had my six gyms at the time, I mean, I was 24, 25 years old and I was explaining to my then girlfriend, now wife, I was like, I have to make $100,000 every month, every month. I have to make that before I get to make any money. And so it was just this, like, this weight, this heaviness. Now, obviously you get into the game, you do it enough times and you, know, you, you get better at it. And eventually it starts becoming normal because you just adapt to it. But, but I'm just saying it's heavy for everyone. And if anyone's getting into it, this is not, I feel like I've become like anti-entrepreneurship. That is not my point here. I'm just <laughs> saying it's a hard path. Both paths are hard. Some people are not fit for entrepreneurship. And I think that there will be probably some swing back in the pendulum of, of entrepreneurship stop, you know, will not be as cool in 10 years or something. Um, I think that's, that, that might be the case on the flip side. You might have a lot more multi gig people, you know, gig economy with multiple side hustles, things like that. 
um, that'll end up happening. But anyhow. No, I, I think that's a really important perspective because as you said on Instagram, social media, it's very glorified at the moment and everyone wants to have a crack. And I actually think that's amazing. Like, you know, yeah. I'm an optimist and very yeah. positive person about this. I'm like, that's incredible that you can find something that you're passionate about and build a business out of literally anything. I think yes. you can literally build a business around any subject matter, but yes. it, it's really hard work to make it work in certain fields and industries and more so than others, you know, some more than others. Let me put this one caveat. Absolutely pro entrepreneurship, absolutely against huge million dollar expectations. That is, there's the statement that I've been trying to make. Absolutely pro entrepreneurship, absolutely against you thinking you're going to be in the 1% your first year. That's all. Yeah. I think the, the patience aspect is super important. And if you go into it, it should be for the long term. But it's challenging with, you know, Instagram and all of that. People want it overnight. They, they see this seemingly, yeah. you know, overnight success. And it's just not the case. So you mentioned there that there, there was a point or there were probably several points or a long period of time where it was really hard just to go from like paycheck to paycheck to pay off your expenses. And I remember reading in your book, $100 million offers, which everyone should read. Uh, and it's, it's basically free on Amazon. It's like 99 cents. Uh, in that book, you talked about an anecdote where you actually were almost at like a kind of breaking point financially, I think. I think it was like 2016. And you, your, your business partner, you just sold like five of your six gyms. Uh, but yeah. Please clarify this. And you, he stole all of your money that you took from it, like 50 grand or something yeah. like that. What, what was it that got you over the line in, in that moment? And what was that experience like? If you could just elaborate on that story for the listeners. <laughs> It was horrible, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I I described the moment in the book, but I mean, I just felt very dead inside. You know, I mean, I don't I actually don't even think I got to go to the negative degree. I think I just unplugged from my emotions because, like, mm -hmm. it took me it took me years to actually like rekindle like feeling like emoting as a human being because it, it's easier to not feel the lows and not feel the highs and just feel numb. It's easier for long periods of time to do that. At some point, though, it's kind of like the risk of the job where it's good. At, like sometimes you need to get into that zone for the short term to just avoid the, the devastation or whatever that you're feeling. But for me, I mean, it's hard. Maybe maybe the younger people will understand. But like I had so much pressure, self-imposed pressure, well, not really even self-imposed pressure that was very real imposed by, you know, my, my parents and specifically my father, that this was a terrible decision. And so you know, the growing the gyms, I still didn't get approval or acceptance for that success. Never did. Um, and then selling them was going to be like, okay, this is some level of material success. And then to have it vanish after four years of building the six gyms, you know, I was left with nothing. And it, it was, it was almost like four years of my life was just gone. I had nothing to show for it, or at least as I perceived it at the time, I had nothing to show for it. But me now saying this, like in, 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 in retrospect, the next month I made $100,000 after losing everything. And so it's such a fallacy. It was such a poor level of thinking to think to myself, I have nothing to show for it. When in reality, those gyms were never for me to make money on. Those gyms were for me to learn the game of business, right? And so what I had left from that was every skill that I developed in my tool set, which then built the next year, literally 12 months later, $28 million in revenue. And so like my work was working on me more than I was working on it. Mm. And I think that if we can take that perspective and I, I do, and I espouse that a lot with the younger entrepreneurs that I speak with, um, it will do a world of good. And it's just, I, I, I just like, I'm so passionate about this concept because it's so hard right now for the 18 year olds and 20 year olds and 22 year olds, because like it, the, the, the expectations that are out there are so unrealistic and so inflated. The average high schooler, senior believes that they will be 52% of high schoolers. They did a survey in the U S believe they will be a millionaire by 25, 52%. Wow. More than half believe they will be a millionaire by 25. It's just, it's just like, it's just, it's so, so, so far away from reality. Mm. That's not even 1%, not 1% of 25 year olds are, are <laughs> you're talking point zero, zero, you know what I mean? 1%. Mm. Like it's such, such, such a rare feat to think that the majority more than half think that is such a, is such a fallacy to me, which is why I feel like my, the, the when I get, when I go on a, a, an audience that, that is like this, I'm like way less tactical and way more just like 
guys, if you can just expand your time horizon. So my neighbor's 18 and he's like my little mentee that I've been, I've been taking on in his entrepreneurial career. It's like, if I, if I can get you to sign a contract that says that I can get you to a million dollars a year, but you can't make any money for 10 years, would you sign the contract today? <laughs> a lot of them would say yes. Good question. A lot of people would say yes. If I said, you'll make tw- you'll make a million dollars when you're 28, it'll take you 10 years. Will you sign that contract? Because here's the thing. If you approach the game that way and say, what thing can I do now that if extrapolated over 10 years, it would be reasonable for me to believe that over that period of time, I will grow by incrementally 10%, 20% a year, right? And I will get to that in that time period. But what ends up happening is that they want to make a million dollars in 90 days from whatever today is, right? Mm -hmm. And 90 days from now, they'll want to make a million dollars in 90 days. And they'll jump from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing, expecting that this will be the thing. And 10 years from now, they'll still be thinking they're 90 days away. When the reality is that if you just started from the beginning, you learn the fundamentals and you actually play the game without the expectation, you'll learn to play the game better because you'll actually learn the trench knowledge and you'll do the skills instead of trying to make the shortcuts, you'll do the work and then the work will work on you. And even if you lose it all five years in, like I did Mm. twice, you'll develop the character traits, the skills and the beliefs that will set you up. Mm. Yeah. That's awesome advice. And I think, I think the skill set is something people overlook when a business fails this, the skill set acquired people will, when a business does fail and, you know, like 90 plus percent yeah. of businesses fail, people are like, what a waste of time. People look down from the other angle, like people who don't want to go into business who maybe should try it out are saying, yeah. well, all these businesses are failing. And it's like, well, it only takes one successful business venture to win big. Yeah. And, and it's hard to win big in any other area uh, besides investing. You just have to, you have to accept that failure is a part of not a judgment for your entrepreneurial career. It's a part of, like, mm. ev- like it is a requisite, like it is required. Mm. It is required. If you do not fail, you will not succeed. Your first business, like if you're going to be an entrepreneur and this is the game you want to play, just look at all the great entrepreneurs of all time. They've, they've all had tons of different businesses. At this point, I've had 18 different businesses. Wow. Wild, right? Yeah. And so the thing is, is we have this fallacy, this false belief that we think that we're getting into, into the game, that this is going to be the thing, right? Drop shipping on Amazon is going to be the thing, right? You know what I mean? Or whatever. My ATM course, I'm going to put ATMs in every single, you know, whatever, right? Whatever these, all these, these business opportunities are, they think it's going to be the thing. When in reality, you might learn two skills from that course, and then you'll buy another course. You'll learn two more skills. And the thing is, is the scoreboard will still say zero. And that's the problem is that psychology is binary. Reality exists on a continuum. Mm -hmm. If I can make a single shift in perspective for everyone who's listening, success is a continuum, not a binary. It's not, I am successful. I am not successful. It's how successful am I? And how skilled am I? Not, am I skilled? Am I not skilled? How skilled am I? And so let's say, and this is the reality in terms of like people like, I want to learn marketing. They'll say amorphous things. They don't even know what they're saying, right? I want to learn marketing. And I'll be like, what's that? What does that entail? What is marketing? Marketing is actually not anything, right? Marketing is a, a, a word that we use to cover 30 different smaller skills, right? Writing headlines, writing copy, making creative, place, buying media, right? Building, you know, building web pages, uh, you know, creating offers, right? Make, you know what I mean? There's, there's all these, you know, all these subcomponent, you know, email follow, like there's all of these pieces that go into that. And they say, I want to learn marketing. And so then they buy a course on, I just use this as an example, they buy a course on copywriting and then they don't become a millionaire 90 days later and they think, ah, this this course is a scam. When in reality, you need to learn arithmetic before you can learn multiplication, before you can learn algebra. One is a stepping stone for the next one. It is a sequence. And so the the visual that I like to give for, for the new entrepreneurs is it's a bridge between where you are and where you want to go. And there's a big bucket of dollars on the other side of this bridge and there's you on this side, right? And until you build every single piece of the bridge, the dollar cannot walk across into your pocket. And so what happens is you might have 40 or 50 skills that you might need to acquire. You got to learn how to sell. You got to learn some sort of skill that you can sell uh, in and of itself, like the thing you are fulfilling in addition to the skill of sales, right? You might have to learn how to do lead generation, right? Which would be like, am I going to use paid ads? Am I going to use 
earn media? Am I going to use affiliates? Am I going to use referrals and word of mouth strategy? Am I going to use a cold outbound, right? There's, there's all these different strategies that we can use to get customers. Which one am I going to use? If I'm using cold calling, well, I got to learn a pickup script. I got to learn how I'm going to get the, the data and I got to scrape it. And I'm saying this not to overwhelm people, but to explain that it's not like two things you have to learn and you're going to make money. You got to learn like 30 or 40 skills. And if it's like, wow, Alex, that sounds like a lot. Well, if getting rich were easy, everyone would do it. And it wouldn't be worthwhile because everyone would do it. And so if, you, if we can appreciate that there are lots of bricks on this bridge and we need to place them one at a time. And if you buy a course and you don't immediately become a millionaire, it doesn't mean that it was a failure and it doesn't mean you are a failure. It just means you're one step closer to becoming a millionaire. Yeah. And so if we can just shift that one perspective, that would be like my greatest desire for anybody who's listening is if you can just think to yourself, I am closer to my goal rather than I am a binary, A, B, failure, success. And so here's what's funny. People will buy the courses and they'll watch the YouTube videos and they'll, you know, they'll go through the content and all this stuff, right? And then what happens is, let's say they've got 30, you know, let's say they bought five courses. Each course delivered, uh, you know, five bricks of the 30 bricks that are required. So they got 25 out of 30 bricks, right? And on the sixth course, they get the last five bricks that are required, right? And then all of a sudden, they're like, the other five courses I read were all shit. This was the one, right? When in reality, you don't piss on your, your, your second grade reading teacher because she didn't teach you Shakespeare. She taught you how to read. Mm -hmm. And you had to learn how to read before you could learn prose. And so I think that like these are, these are things that if we can shift people's perspective from the, the psychological binary to the continuum of reality, a lot more people will be successful because they won't see it as a failure. They'll see it as a path, a marker on their way to where they're trying to go. And my ask is that if you choose to play the entrepreneurial game, that you, and, I, and this is a guarantee, and I don't give many of them, I guarantee you that if you do not quit, you will win. It's much more a game of grit and persistence than it is skill and knowledge. It's just how many times going to get hit in the face, mostly emotionally, mostly based on self-imposed pressures that you put on yourself about being a success because of whatever made up thing that you think matters that you later find out when you're 80 doesn't matter at all. Sorry, I I get, on my, get off my pulpit. That's great. No, I got to <laughs> let you go. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic advice. In terms of Measuring success, though, if we talk about business metrics and we go a little bit more specific, when you, for your acquisition.com, for instance, when you're looking at investing in companies, what are the metrics for success that you look at? So I made one video on what I consider the perfect business, but unique, expensive, sticky air, right? Managed by somebody who has character and a long-term mindset. And so I can break down each of those, those components, but Unique, it's something that no one else is doing or something that's being done in a way that's very difficult to replicate. Expensive, so, and that's relative to the air part, which is very low cost of goods or zero cost of replicating the goods. Expensive, meaning there's lots of gross margin in the business. And sticky, meaning it's habit forming or has some sort of repeat and recurring revenue to make the business more stable. And then the, the component about who is running it, it's run by somebody who has strong ethics uh, and has a long-term mindset about how they want to build the company. And so if I have all of those things and the types of businesses, um, that would be, in my opinion, a business that I would look into. Me specifically with an acquisition.com, I focus on education and training companies. It's either code or media. So I like media companies. So companies that license media, companies that are big, like that have big audiences, things like that. I love those types of niche audiences. So like the best plumber, the best mechanic, mm -hmm. the best, you know, whatever, those types of vertical um education and training businesses. Like we own a publishing business that teaches people how to publish books. We've got, you know, a, a business that's for photographers. We have our gym business. We have the supplement business. We have a software business for agencies. Like, so we have different verticals that we try and go after. Um, we have a certification for, for personal trainers. We have, yeah, there's just, you know, there's a, a wide variety of businesses that we, we participate in. And so either it has to have some sort of code basis, which would be software, or it has to have some sort of media basis, which is licensing typically of some sort. Um, and I like personally education because I think that the education system as a whole is broken. And I think that the demand for skills has never been higher, which is why the rise of the guru empire um, has happened. It's because like these are just supply demand economics, right? Colleges, 
have no value proposition. They're overpriced. They don't deliver. You can get the same jobs before and after college, except you lose four years and you don't work for four years and you lose the money that you go into debt for that you cannot get out of, at least in the United States. You're literally not allowed to bankrupt out of the money. Like you owe them forever. And that's because like, it's so, I feel like it's so ethically wrong that they do this. Like they let an 18 year old kid take $200,000 in debt, but they won't give you a $200,000 loan to start a business. Like it's insane to me. Whereas the prospect that if you, if you spent $200,000 on e-learning and courses and mentorship, guaranteed you would make in four years. And this is what I had to talk to my neighbor, his mother, because she's like, I got him to quit college. And she was so worried. She's like, what are you doing? And I was like, if you give me four years with your son, he will make more than you make. And they live in my neighborhood. So it's a nice neighborhood. <laughs> and, and she was like, and they trust me a lot. They, they, they like me. And they're like, all right, like, well, we'll trust you. And he's doing great, you know, and he's probably making 90,000 a year right now. He's 19. And I was like, this is year one. I was like, I got three more years. <laughs> I like, I was like, and, and his net worth is over six figures right now. He's 19 because he saves everything he makes. Right. And so, you know what I mean? Like the game is, is just meant to be played. And, and those are the types of companies that I look for um, that we're, we're trying to invest in. And typically want them over 5 million a year is kind of the, the baseline. So like the biggest company in the portfolio that we have um, does about 30, the smallest is about 8 million. No, well, your uh, your neighbor's a lucky kid for sure. <laughs> I'll I'll come I'll come back to the school point in a second that you just mentioned, but but very quickly, I just wanted to see if you had any advice for businesses out there who are still small businesses. Yeah. Maybe they're doing one hundred thousand to a million, maybe up yeah. to three million dollars. Some quick tips. Maybe a, it's a mindset thing. How do they scale their business? What's the difference between kind of ten x in your business and just mm-hmm. increasing the profit margin or the revenue by ten to twenty percent each year? Yeah. So, uh, you know, zero to one, zero to three million is typically just one product, one avatar, one channel. Simplest way. And most people are, are really scattered, which is why they actually stay stuck there. So you really have to focus, right? And that's at really the six figure level or, you know, multiple six figure level. They're just stuck. They're trying to do too many things for too many people. And there's only one of them and they have no leverage. So because you have no leverage, you have to focus. That's the reality. And that's, that's the, just the business economics around it. like you, there's only one of you. You don't have leverage, meaning you don't have other people's time and you don't have that much money. So you have to, you have to be doing a lot of hats. And if you're doing a lot of hats and you need to only do a handful of things to make sure that it works. Once you're at you know one to three million ish, then it actually focuses a lot more on back end. So in the beginning, you just gotta learn to sell something, right? Um, and ideally you wanna be good at the thing that you're selling, right? Um, but then you focus on back end, which is gonna be increasing lifetime gross profit per customer. And so there are six ways of doing that. One is you increase the prices. Uh, the second is that you decrease your costs of, of doing business. The third is you get them to buy more times, which in the context of a, a recurring base business would be decreasing churn. So you get more purchases. That increases the lifetime gross profit per customer. Uh, the fourth would be upsell. So selling more of the same things. That's like taking a 20 ounce Coke and getting a 32 ounce Coke. Uh, if you wanted to do uh, cross sells, that would be having a Coke and upselling fries, sorry, cross selling fries. So it's a different type of thing that you'd be surfacing your customer with. And then the sixth way is downselling. So somebody who would normally, who otherwise would not buy your services, but then chooses to buy because there's something else that is cheaper and available for them. And so we would look at a business like that's doing three, four, five million, whatever. And usually we will, we will pick which of these strategies we think or which combination of these strategies will multiply the lifetime gross profit to be in a range that becomes more attractive, which then kicks off more net free cash flow. Or for everyone who's, who's, who's listening, it means the amount of cash you can take out of the business without threatening the business, right? This owner earnings. So if it spits off more net free cash flow, then we can take that extra cash flow and then now, because of the higher average order value, higher lifetime gross profit per customer, we can spend more in the acquisition, which either we will do on the exact same channel we were just on. And because of the increased lifetime gross profit, we will spend more and get more customers that way. Or we will expand it to another channel that we can now afford to do profitably because before this, let's say we were getting three to one on our main channel, just example, right? Um, and... And on another channel, we, we, can't, we can't afford to market there because we're getting one-to-one. It's just, there's no point, right? But if we, if we, have, if we can change the metrics so that we're getting you know, 15 to one, right? Now, because we've improved the backend, maybe we added another service category, um, you know, increased the product suite or had a higher level, whatever, right? Um, 
then we got 15 to one on our main channel. Then we could go to another channel. Maybe we have five to one, but now we have a whole nother new set of, of, of customers that we could have access to. Hmm. Just in terms of the school system being broken, uh, it's, it's a, everything works a little bit differently here in Australia, but certainly from an educational point of view and having gone through the system here myself, uh, something they don't teach at all, basically, except in a very kind of uh, indirect way through things like learning about compound interest, et cetera, is personal wealth and, and building sure. personal wealth. And I would love to hear what your advice would be or actually what kind of features you would include in a course for 17 to 18 year olds if there was a course on building personal wealth, build, building towards financial independence in life? What would be some of the critical features of that course? It's really, um, it's a really hard subject that I care a lot about um, because it's, it's it, in some ways it's super simple, in some ways it's really complex. And so like, it's hard because there's some people that I'm thinking of that I'd be like, oh, this is how I talk to you about this. And then for many others, I would say, we're not talking about that at all. We're just gonna focus on these things, right? And so I think wealth gets people excited. But what it really is, is personal finance. Uh, and that's what people need. That is, that is the requisite step. That is the arithmetic before the multiplication, right? Like we have to learn how to add and subtract before we can start doing multiplication. And so it, it, it kind of functions like that with personal finance. Like if you can't save money, you can't invest and become wealthy. And people don't know how to save money and are trying to invest and become wealthy when they're broke as fuck. Sorry, broke as darn. It just, it's putting the cart before the horse. And I'll tell you a quick story that maybe will we'll drive this point home. I got a DM from an 18-year-old kid. Um, and he said, hey, I'd love some investing advice. I've got $2,000 saved up. It's making me $100 a month, which I have no idea how he's getting 100% returns or whatever the hell it is. I'm sure it's some crypto nonsense. But the point <laughs> is, is he's like, I want some investing advice. And the thing is, is people are we're doing things out of sequence, right? No one... Unless you are in 2009 buying Bitcoin for 30 cents, ain't going to happen anymore. Unless you're that guy, no one's getting rich on two grand. No one's getting rich on 10 grand. Really, no one's getting rich on 100 grand. So that investment, in my opinion, should be in skills. If you empty your person to your mind, no one can take it from you. That's a paraphrasing of a Ben Franklin quote who is the president of the United States for your, for your Australian audience. <laughs> All right. Um, and generally smart dude. Anyways. Step one is personal finance is most people far, far, far overextend themselves. They get credit cards, they get in debt. And it's just this consumerism that just is so stupid because they're flexing for people to pretend like they're successful. It's just the dumbest thing in the world. And so I guess the question for most people is like, the adding and subtracting of personal finance is simple. The question is, why aren't you doing it? Right. And so then, and then you have to face the real things, which is like, I'm wildly insecure. I care about what everyone else thinks. I would rather like, I'll ask you this question. That everyone can think about this for themselves. Would you rather everyone think you were wealthy, but actually be poor or have everyone think you are poor and actually be wealthy? And I think the root of that answer will tell you whether or not you will be wealthy. And until you solve that question the right way, until you truly internalize that and you decide, I would rather feed my family without anxiety. I would rather have a wife who is supported. I would rather own my home in cash. I would rather drive a used car, you know, my, my, pretty much most of my adult life until my, my income far exceeds, you know, what I would ever, ever pay. And I continue to reinvest all of the excess cash that I have because I don't spend it on stupid stuff into my brain, into more skills. If you can play that game, you'll win. And I'll just tell one quick story, which is like in the beginning, I slept on the floor of my gym for nine months when I started my first business because I couldn't afford two months. So it's $5,000 a month and I had $5,000 total. <laughs> so like, <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do. I remember doing $5,000 in sales the first month and then watching the rent check go out and having it go back down to zero and being like, shit, what am I going to do? I was able to the next month do $10,000 and I kept five. The next month I made $15,000 and kept 10. The next month I made $20,000 and kept 15. And I did that all the way up to $35,000 a month. That whole time, I still slept on the floor. 
And so I think, and like I showed up to my first ever like event that I held for the gym owners and I had this girl and I drove up in a, in a, a used Prius that we own in cash with a dent on the side and a cracked windshield. And we pulled up to the event and some of the clients who were paying us a lot of money uh, to be there, they were paying $40,000 a year, right? So I'm driving a car that's five grand. <laughs> yeah. And I show up and, and this woman, Monica Batar, she says, she says, I thought you were supposed to be rich. And I say, you should see my bank account. <laughs> and I was a millionaire at the time. And so I share that story because people sometimes see how we live now. But proportionally to my income, I live on less than 2% of what I make. And so even if I spend $20,000 a month, $50,000 a month, it makes no difference to my like anything. And it looks crazy though, like flying in private jets and all of this stuff. But like, that's not like, don't look at what people do now and try and emulate that. That's those are not the successful actions. The successful actions were eating shit for a long time, far, far, far living, living far below my means for a very, very long period of time, dumping all of my excess cash into my brain so that I could develop skills so that someday I wouldn't have to save as much from from a, I wouldn't have to skimp on my savings because my cash flow so far exceeded it. And I didn't start actually spending more than $9,000 a month. And that may sound like a lot, I get it. But the, when we started spending more than $9,000 a month, I was taking home over 1.5 million a month. I lived on, or lived on an apartment that cost me $1,200 a month when I was taking home a million a month. Wow. A one bedroom. And so I think this is the piece that is lost like in, in the, in the Instagram culture. Humble beginnings. You were humble, yeah. humble throughout. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just saying it for context. It's like, we just don't get ahead of ourselves. Just the investment should be in your brain. It's not like, it's not just an aphorism. Like it's, if you get smarter, you get the skills, you'll make the money, right? Mm-hmm. Like thinking that, that, that you're going to hit it big on the next Bitcoin. It, it's such a, it's such a crapshoot. You're not going to be lucky. You're just going to lose. That's all. Like the statistics are far in your favor that you're just buying lottery tickets rather than buying the sure thing, which is that if you increase the value of yourself, you will always be able to make more money than you need. That's awesome, man. And uh, that's a good place to wrap. Alex, do you want to just tell people where they can find you, find more of your content? Sure. You can go on YouTube. You can search my name, Alex Ramosi, uh, H-O-R-M-O-Z-I. Uh, acquisition.com is my portfolio company. and It owns all the other subsidiaries. Uh, I have a free course on there that goes with the book that's 99 cents. Uh, there's no opt-in. There's no upsells. It's all free. It has downloads, checklists, everything you need to create your first offer uh, to sell to a marketplace, independent of whatever type of business you want to start, whether it's mowing lawns, you know, uh, being, a, being a babysitter, putting ATMs in place, selling marketing services, doing drop shipping. It doesn't really matter. It all is going to start with an offer that you're making to the marketplace in that book. And, uh, and the course will show you how to do it. Thanks so much, man. So guys, make sure you check out those channels. Uh, and remember, he has nothing to sell you. I think that's an important point. <laughs> uh, Alex, thanks so much, man. That was like tremendous advice and uh, your energy is palpable. So uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope everyone learned a whole lot from this. And uh, just thanks for everything you're putting out because there's not a lot of people who are as wealthy and successful as you who are putting out the quantity of content that you are. And YouTube's such a, a wonderful platform. And for you to be using it the way you are uh, is is really appreciated uh, by me and, and the community out there. So thank you I so much. It, no, you bet. Thanks. And I have a podcast called The Game if you want to search for that too, if you're a podcaster. I've got that too. So Awesome. Thanks so, thanks much. so much, Alex. Great to see you, man. All right. Later, brother.